Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two to five player game, Istanbul, designed by Rudiger Dorn and published by AEG, who helped sponsor this video. In Istanbul, there's money to be made and rubies to be collected by the merchant who can craftily navigate the busy streets, sell their wares, and avoid the local authorities. The other merchants are already hard at work, so join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up for your very first game, you'll need to attach the included stickers to the tops of these wooden pieces. Then you'll start by laying out these 16 place tiles in a 4x4 grid. Each tile has a series of three numbers here in the top left hand corner, and these will help you create the different layouts. For your first game, they recommend what is called the short paths layout, putting the tiles in order from 1 to 16 using the smaller center value. Yours should look exactly like this when you're done, and we'll discuss the other layout options at the end of this video. But later versions of the game will only have one number in this top left hand corner. But you can still create this pattern. You just won't be able to order them from 1 to 16 using this smaller number because, well, that smaller number won't exist. Instead, just lay out the tiles like you see here. Now, sort these mosque tiles into four piles based on the colors of these symbols found at the top and then order them within each stack from the highest number of symbols on the bottom to the lowest one on top. Now, if you only have three players, remove the tiles with five symbols from the game. And if you only have two players, as I'm setting up here, remove the ones with three and five symbols. Place these on the matching spaces of the two mosques and in their bottom corners, put a number of these rubies equal to the number of players, unless you have five players, in which case you'll only put four rubies on each mosque. On this Wainwright, you'll put one ruby per player and then three of these wheelbarrow extensions per player stacked like this. So in a two player game, you'd have six of them. At the Sultan's Palace, place rubies from right to left, stopping on this space if you have four or five players or stopping here if you only have two or three. Do the same thing on the gemstone dealer, placing rubies until you get to the space showing your number of players. At the post office, place these mail cubes into the topmost spaces. At the large market, shuffle these dark demand tiles into a face-up stack, placing them here. And do the same thing here at the small market with these lighter tiles. By the board, shuffle and place these bonus cards face down along with the two dice and the coins. This is the governor and the smuggler, and you'll now roll the dice, adding the values together, so eight in this case, and then you put the governor on the tile with that number. And again, we're using the center number, so it would go on this one. Then you'll roll the dice again and place the smuggler in the same way on the tile that matches this combined value. Each player now takes the wooden components of their chosen color along with a wheelbarrow and overview tile. On these gray spaces, put your four cubes and then place this cylinder, known as your family member, on the police station. At the fountain, each player will stack four of their assistant discs, placing their stickered merchant on top. You'll have one leftover assistant, which you now put beside the board. Now randomly pick a first player, giving them this marker and two lira. In clockwise order, each other player gets one more lira than the previous one. So this player would get three, and if we had a third player, they would get four, and so on. Then deal one of these bonus cards to everyone, and you can examine your own card, but keep it a secret from the other players. In a two-player game, you'll also place the merchant discs of the unused colors on the two mosques and also on the gemstone dealer. And that's the setup. In Istanbul, you're a merchant leading your assistants through a crowded bazaar, dropping them off to do various tasks, but eventually, you're going to have to go gather them up again. So you want to chart a very efficient course as you try to collect the prized rubies that will be required to win. The game is played over a series of turns, starting with the first player, and then going clockwise around and around the table. And on your turn, you'll perform four phases, starting with movement. You'll find the four phases summarized here on your player reference. And as you can see at the top, it tells us that during the movement phase, you'll move your merchant and the stack of assistants under it, if any, one or two places. A place is any one of the 16 different tiles, and when moving, you have to go from one place to an adjacent one, but you cannot move diagonally, and you must end on a different place than what you started the turn on. You then check to see if whether or not the space that you moved to already has one of your assistants there waiting. Of course, with your first move, there won't be. So if you don't find an assistant there, you will instead remove an assistant from the bottom of your stack and leave it there. 
This means on a future turn, when you move, you'll be leaving that assistant behind. In this case, as you can see, there's no assistant here either, so we would drop another one off. In this way, over time, as you move, you'll be dropping assistants behind in various places. Now let me just set up a different example so I can show you what happens if, after moving, the space that you go to already has one of your assistants there. Instead of dropping one off, you instead place your stack on top of the one there, and now on your next movement, it will travel with you. So to summarize, if after you move, the space that you've gone to already has one of your assistants, then you pick it up. If it doesn't, then you drop one off. Now if, on the other hand, you move to a space and there are no assistants there, and your merchant doesn't have any more to drop off, or if you simply choose not to drop one off, which is also an option, then your turn ends immediately and the next player goes. And don't forget you're reminded of all three of these possibilities right here on your player reference tile. After moving and adjusting your assistance as necessary, if there are other players' merchants there, you must pay them two lira each. If you can't, or you choose not to, your turn ends immediately. With two players, if you encounter merchants not controlled by other players, you instead pay the required lira to the supply. You then roll two dice for each of these types of merchants, moving them to the new space shown. Now, assuming that after your movement, you were able to place or pick up an assistant and pay lira for any merchants there, you may then choose to carry out the action of the target place you arrived at. So let's go through each of these and see how they work. If you go to any one of these places, then you move the cube of the indicated track on your wheelbarrow that matches this symbol to the far rightmost space. This indicates how much of that good that you have. So while here, it would mean that I have two of this good known as fruit. This is spice, this is fabric. This symbol is for jewelry, and we'll see how you can collect that a little bit later. If you go to the Wayne right, as shown here, you can choose to pay seven lira to the general supply to add one of these extensions to your wheelbarrow. Now, when you go to any one of the three previous places that we learned about, when you would gain the good of that type, you'll get more of it. Once you visit the Wainwright three different times, your wheelbarrow will be fully built. There will be no room to add any more extensions, but then you'll get to take one of the rubies from here. Each time you gain a ruby in the game, you'll add it to the leftmost available space here on the cart. With this fully constructed, you can still go to the Wainwright, but you will not be able to add any more extensions or collect any other rubies from here. Going to the post office gives you all of the uncovered items in the display. So in this case, one spice, one fruit, and two lira. Then you move the topmost left male indicator down. Now the next player to go here would get one fabric, one fruit, and two lira, and they'd move this block down. If you would ever take this action and all the tokens are already at the bottom, then after gaining the benefits displayed here at the top, all of these tokens would be moved back up again. If you visit the black market, then you choose to gain either a single fabric, spice, or fruit. And then, as shown here, you'll roll both of the dice. Based on the total value of your roll, you'll then gain either one, two, or three jewelry. In this case, I rolled the five, which isn't anywhere on this chart, so I'll gain nothing. Keep in mind, you can never collect more than what you can carry in your cart. So even if I had rolled 12, giving me three jewelry, I would only be able to collect two. At the tea house, you'll pick any number between three and 12 and say it out loud. So in this case, I'll say five. You then roll the two dice. If the total of the two numbers you rolled is equal to or greater than your chosen value, you take an amount of lira from the bank equal to the value you chose. So five in this case. This means that if I'd been willing to be a little more risky and had said nine instead, I would have collected nine lira. Now, if the total value on the rolled dice had been less than what you had declared, you will only take two lira from the supply. Whether you go to the small or large market, the steps that you follow are the same. Here, you will sell as many of the depicted goods as you can or wish to that are showing on the top tile of the location that you visited. And then, depending on how many of those you were able to fulfill, you will get a certain amount of lira as shown on the chart here. So as we can see, there's a total of five different goods I could sell. I only have two of the possible three spice I could sell, but I also can sell one fruit and one fabric. Every time you sell a good, as I've been doing, you move its marker one space to the left. Now, since I sold a total of four of the five depicted goods, I would collect 14 lira from the bank and add to my personal supply. After selling to a market, you then move the tile that was on top to the bottom of the stack so that a new one is revealed. At the Sultan's Palace, you'll pay all of the goods shown in this track that are not covered by a ruby, and then you take the leftmost ruby as your reward. So in this case, I would have to spend one jewelry, one fabric, one spice, one fruit, and then this symbol means 
one of anything else, so I'll spend another fruit. I then take this gem, placing it in my cart, and this has now revealed a new space. So now the next person who wants the next gem has to pay all of these goods. The gemstone dealer works in a similar way, except that you pay an amount of lira equal to the highest value showing on this track. So here, it would be 15. Then you take the leftmost ruby, making the next one that someone wants to purchase a little more expensive. The fountain is a special location because it's the only place where you can take its action even if you have no assistant to drop off or pick up. By going here, you may return any number of your assistants from anywhere on your board back under your merchant stack. You may choose to leave some of them where they are because you plan to go there on a later turn to gather them up anyway. If you go here to the police station and your family member token is there, you may immediately free it and send it to another place taking the action of that location. Unlike your merchant, your family member cannot have encounters with other types of tokens. For example, you do not pay lira if you send it to a place that has another merchant. If you go to either of the mosques, then pick one of the tiles at that location which you don't already have. And if your wheelbarrow contains the amount of good shown here at the top, then you can spend one of that good to take that top tile. So in this case, I would need two jewelry, which I have. And then I would spend only one of it to take this tile. Now if a player comes to this location and wants this type of tile, they'll need to have four jewelry in their wheelbarrow. But still, to actually take the tile, they only have to spend one of it. That's a very important distinction to understand. The number of symbols here is not how much you spend, but how much you need to have when you arrive at that location. You will only ever pay one of that good to take the tile. If a player has collected both of the tiles found at a particular mosque, then they also claim one of the rubies there and add it to their cart. Each of the four different types of tiles will provide you with benefits, so let's see how these work. If you gain the red tile, then at either the black market or the tea house, after rolling the dice, you can choose to either turn one of the results to a four, or re-roll both of the dice one time. With the yellow tile, once each turn, you may pay two lira to return any one of your assistants back underneath of your merchant stack. If you have one of these green tiles, then whenever you use any one of the three different types of warehouses, you may pay two lira to gain one single additional good of any other color. So by going here, I would fill my cart with spices, and then I could pay two lira to gain one jewelry. If you gain this tile, then you immediately take your fifth assistant from beside the board and put it underneath of your merchant. Just note, you can never have more than one of each type of mosque tile. Now we come to the final location we have to go over, the Caravansary. And here you will take two bonus cards from the stack, adding them to your hand, and then you pick any one card from your hand to discard face up here. Once you have cards in this area, then when taking the Caravansary action, you can choose to draw from either the top of the draw or discard pile. However, if you're gaining bonus cards because of some other effect in the game, then those can only be taken from the top of the draw pile. If this pile ever runs out, immediately shuffle the discarded ones into a new draw pile. And we won't go over all the different bonus card effects in this video, as they're explained right here on your player reference. But on your turn, you may resolve any number of bonus cards you have whenever you like, and after one has been used, it is placed face up in the discard pile here. And those are all of the actions, but keep in mind, carrying out the action of a place is optional. That said, whether you performed it or not, you'll then check to see if either other players' family members, the governor, or the smuggler is in your space. If you're anywhere but the police station and you encounter another player's family member, then you capture them and send them directly to the police station, gaining one bonus card or three lira for each of them. If the governor is there, then you may choose to draw one bonus card, adding it to your hand. And then if you do, you'll pay either two lira back to the bank or discard one bonus card from your hand to the caravansary. And you can choose to discard the one you just drew if you like. If the smuggler is there, you may choose to gain any one good of your choice and then you must either pay two lira or one other good. After using the ability of the governor or the smuggler, roll the dice and move them to that space, rolling separately if they were both there. Just remember, only merchant stacks can encounter other players' family members or the smuggler or governor. So those are the steps of a turn. Move your stack, encounter other merchants, if there are any, carry out the actions, if you choose to, and resolve any encounters with other pieces there. 
After your turn, the next player in clockwise order goes, and so on, around and around the table, until eventually a player has collected five rubies, or in a two-player game, has collected six. This will trigger the end of the game, in which case you complete the round so that everyone has had an equal number of turns using this first player token as a reminder. So if I had just collected my sixth ruby, then this player would get one more turn and then the game would be over. Now each player may choose to use their leftover bonus cards that provide either goods or money if they wish to, and then the player with the most rubies wins. In this case, it would be the blue player. Now if there's a tie, then the tied player with the most lira wins. If there's still a tie, then the tied player with the most leftover goods in their wheelbarrow wins. If there's still a tie, then the tied player with the most leftover bonus cards wins. And if there's still a tie, then the tied players share the victory. And that's how you play Istanbul. Now, on the back of the rules, you'll find variants of play and several different ways to lay out the pieces when setting up to ensure variety each time you play. But I'll leave these for you to discover on your own. This game also has expansions you can pick up separately that add new elements, but there's also a big box edition with everything collected into one set. If you have any questions about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the game's page at BoardGameGeek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notifications anytime we post a new video. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.